and not an hour later they were both with a kindly civil defender named Tixel and several of his men, plunging in an official vehicle through the forest. But the first thing Neelix noticed was that the door to the hut was closed. The door was open when I left. Someone's been here. Tixel nodded and drew his weapon. He paused at the door, then flung it open and stepped in. The tortured man wasn't there. The chair he'd sat in was back in its usual place near the small table. Dust covered the floor, and there were no footprints. Neelix took a breath. He was here, right here, tied into that chair. Neelix glanced up at his father, who was watching carefully as Tixel completed his examination of the room. Finally, Tixel turned toward them, eyes troubled. I don't know what to say, Neelix. I can't see any indication that anyone's been here in a long time. He glanced at Neelix's father, then looked down at the floor with some embarrassment. I apologize for bringing this up, but I feel I must. Reludian crystals have become popular with a number of young people these days. Neelix heard his father gasp. Father, I have never, never touched those things, and I never would. Tixel finally drew a deep breath. I'll have my men make a thorough search of the woods. I promise we'll let you know the results. Neelix's father nodded, put an arm around his son's shoulder, and led him from the hut. It was in complete silence that they made their way back through the woods to home. Tixel deposited them at their door and promised to contact them tomorrow. Neelix went to his room and got in bed, where he huddled like a small child. The smell of burnt flesh assailed him. He had no idea how long he'd been there when he heard a tap at his door. Neelix? It was his father, who stood there with a man who looked vaguely familiar. This is Uxen. Neelix went and sat with the two of them at the dining table as Uxen told his father awful things. The boy must leave Rhinax tonight. If he's here tomorrow, when Tixel comes back, you'll never see him again. I've made arrangements to get him to Talax. His father looked at him solemnly. Uxen is part of a group who are trying to avoid war with Hakon. But there are strong factions that want the war and who consider the moderates a threat. Uxen continued, I believe the man in the hut was one of our group who disappeared several days ago. I have no doubt that Tixel and his men tortured him for information about us. Felix couldn't believe what he was hearing. Tixel? The civil defender? I'm afraid the authorities are riddled with people like him who want war and who will do anything to suppress opposition to it. That night, Neelix was gone, off in the night like a felon on the run. He never saw any of his family again. Inevitably, war broke out. Talax actually made the first strike, the warlike faction of their race having predominated. But after that, it hardly mattered who had started things. The end of the war occurred on a warm spring night, and the terminus took no more than four minutes. Neelix was sitting outside in the walled compound of his hideaway on Talax. He inhaled the spring air deeply and gazed up at Rhinax, luminous in the night sky. As he stared upward at the moon, a curious brightness illuminated Rhinax, turning its whiteness briefly to a cold blue. Then, it began to disappear. It was as though dark fingers began to obscure the moon, creeping swiftly over the surface. Lixissa, a good friend, came running toward him. Neelix, Rhinax is destroyed. A weapon, a horrible weapon, a cascade. Every village on Rhinax is gone. Everyone... Dead. Rage sustained him for weeks after the disaster. The war had ended summarily, with Talax surrendering immediately and becoming, in essence, 
a Hakonian outpost. The weapon, they learned, was called the Metrion Cascade and had been developed in order to bring the war to a swift and certain conclusion. He met Wicks two years after that, while he was in a prolonged euphoria caused by inhaling the smoke of burning Reludian crystals. They weren't really crystals, of course, but dried and ground herbs with a potent narcotic effect. The term crystals had been coined because of the amazing clarity one felt after inhaling the smoke. When he first inhaled the fragrant smoke, Neelix was sorry he'd waited so long. The queasiness in his stomach, a constant since the Metrion Cascade, disappeared. Well-being returned, and he could plan for a future once more. He had to be careful not to become addicted, of course, but that wasn't a problem. He simply chose to use it in order to lessen his pain. Once his life was in order again, he'd quit entirely. Until then, he had to continue finding a supply. That had become more difficult since Hakon had won the war. And so it was that Neelix left Talax, ready to seek fate and fortune among the stars. Among the passengers was Wixaban, a young man near his age, who had a copious supply of crystals which he was willing to share. Neelix, I have friends who've done very well for themselves by collecting discarded items, refurbishing them and then selling them or trading upward. Neelix found Wix impressive and nodded his agreement. I've often been surprised at the things people throw away. Wix nodded. We'll need a ship, of course. We can probably find one in a ship's graveyard. People discard old vessels as casually as they throw out last night's garbage. Neelix was already looking forward to this project. Hey, we can fix it up. Make it as good as new. He clapped Wix on the shoulder in a gesture of goodwill, and Wix threw an arm around him in a brotherly hug. A brother. That's what Wix would become to him. Neelix felt tears of happiness sting his eyes as he realized the pain of the past was no more. He probably wouldn't even need the crystals anymore. They found their ship, a battered but serviceable scout vessel, in a vast graveyard overseen by a huge welliump, a beast-like species with a reputation for being hard bargainers. In the end, they had to relieve the mountainous, hirsute creature of the battered vessel they wanted through subterfuge. After giving him a few drinks of Socrit, a potent liquor, the Welliump, passed out. In minutes, Neelix and Wix had departed the graveyard in the decrepit-looking ship. It was easy, it was fun, and their future was limitless. Tell me where they are, you moldering pile of fecal matter, or I'm going to roast you alive! Neelix held his hands around Wix's throat, driven by outrage. Wix pointed toward the weapons locker of the ship, and Neelix dashed to the locker, throwing out weapons and ammunition in his hunt. When the locker was empty, and he realized he'd been tricked, he whirled on Wix, who was standing at a distance with an electrokinetic pistol pointed at him. You've got to stop using the crystals, Neelix. You tricked me! You unmitigated piece of slime! I'm gonna kill you! Did Wix think he was a blind fool? He flung himself toward Wix in a frenzy, saw the weapon raised, then blackness enveloped him. Neelix's whole body hurt, except for his feet, which he couldn't feel at all. He was bound at the wrists and the ankles, tied to his bunk in the ship. He looked around the cramped quarters and saw Wix sitting nearby. I'm sorry, Neelix, but I had no choice. You were out of your mind. Neelix realized with awful clarity what a serious predicament he was in. Wix was crazy and had slipped into some kind of psychosis and made Neelix a prisoner of his mad fantasy. Wix, why exactly do you think I'm out of my mind? I've never known anyone who needed the crystals so often. Neelix could feel himself beginning to get desperate. Let me go, Wix. 
If you untie me now, there'll be no hard feelings. If you don't, I'll put a blade in your guts and rip them out of your body. Wix's sad eyes held his. It'll be over in a few days. I'll be here. And I'll do my best to take care of you. It was a three-day descent into hell. Again and again he begged Wix to kill him. He had no memory of lapsing into unconsciousness. Then he became aware, gradually, that Wix was sponging his eyelids, loosening the crust. I think you've done it, Neelix. I know it was awful, but you're through with it. It's over. Soon, Neelix understood the extent of the great gift Wix had given him. He had been addicted to the crystals. Tears of gratitude welled in his eyes. Wix smiled and cuffed him gently on the temple. We have to get you up and moving, Neelix. You and I have a business to run. And they did, for almost a year. Neelix felt for the first time since the Metreon Cascade a measure of peace. But the Eubian incident put an end to all this. Neelix and Wix had assembled several crates of micro-arc thrusters, but didn't have enough of the necessary magnetic pumps to render the units functional. So they reasoned they could stack the functional units on the top layer of each crate. So when the Eubians inspected the merchandise, they'd encounter the complete units and not bother checking the rest. It didn't work. The Eubians jailed Wix. Neelix, though feeling guilty, escaped in the ship. Six months later, he found himself in the realm of the Kazan. The Kazan were prime opportunities for barter, because they always needed something to keep ships in repair or to upgrade defensive systems. Neelix moved with relative ease among the various Kazan sects, and so it was that he came to the planet of the Kazan Ogla miners. He had learned that water was more prized than gemstones in this realm. Neelix went to the Ogla armed with tanks of water. He offered to trade for Cormeline. He might have become reasonably well off, but he had never counted on falling in love. He saw her first on a typical visit to the Ogla. Neelix entered the stone structure the Ogla had built to ward off the cruel desert sun. There he saw Jabin, the powerful and mean-spirited Maj of the mining faction. Did you bring water? Indeed, my good friend. I have seven barrels. Almost immediately, one of Neelix's barrels was carried in and set next to Jabin, who called out yet something else. There was a brief silence, and then someone emerged from the deep gloom of the chamber. She was a young sprite, a nymph, a vision of ethereal loveliness. She was also forlorn, wreathed in melancholy. As she neared, Neelix also saw the unmistakable purpling of bruises on her ivory skin. The waif seemed to know her duty. She took cups from a nearby table and, kneeling in front of the water barrel, drew several fingers of the precious liquid into each cup and presented them to Jabin and Neelix. Jabin chuckled a low, throaty growl. <laughs> Quite a beauty, isn't she? But that's where her assets end. She's all but worthless as a slave. A spark flickered in Neelix's mind. I might find household work for her, if you're interested in trading. Jabin snorted and took a sip of the water. She has information I'm determined to get, and I'm ready to move to more persuasive methods. Neelix felt his stomach clutch. What kind of information could be so valuable as to bother with a wretched thing like this? Her people live underground, protected by an entity that sends them energy for all their needs. If I knew how to get down there, the Ogla would have that energy. And then, little man, I wouldn't have need for avaricious barterers like you. Well, if they live beneath the surface, how did you find this one? Jabin cackled. 
She's too curious for her own good. <laughs> She wanted to see what was up here. Despair clutched at Neelix. Then, he felt a thought stirring in his head. Then realized it was more than a thought; it was a sound. Please, help me. Startled, he realized she was communicating with him telepathically. Send her away, Jabin. I'd like to talk to you alone. Jabin jerked his head, and the nymph exited the chamber. Neelix looked at him with a sly confidence. Let me spend some time with her by myself. I think I can get the information you want. How could you possibly do that, Talaxian? Hey, my people have a saying: sweetness brings the tiller birds, tartness leaves them wanting. Before she knows it, she'll be telling me anything I want. After a long silence, Jabin touched his tongue to the cup of water. All right then, we'll try it. And so it was that Elix came to know the Okampan known as Kes, and heard the remarkable story of her climb to freedom, and swift capture, of the entity known as the Caretaker, and of Kes's own indomitable spirit, her intellectual curiosity, her sweetness of manner. They were able to keep Jabin at bay for several weeks, but Elix made an error that sent Kes back into Jabin's hands for interrogation. He stole water. He did it for Kes, of course, but one of Jabin's men discovered the theft, and Neelix ended up running to his ship, yelling at Kes that he'd be back for her. How he intended to do that, he had no idea. He had located the mighty array that supplied the Okampa with energy, and he tried to communicate with the entity that Jabin said controlled it, but to no avail. He tried not to think what Kes might be undergoing at Jabin's hands. He was one man alone in a ship with pitiful weapons. He decided to revisit a debris field he'd encountered some time back. Maybe he'd find something he could trade for weapons. He was trawling through the space rubbish when he spotted a ship of a sort he'd never encountered before. His communication system was activated, and he sprinted to the small screen. Whoever you are, I found this waste zone first. A woman stared back at him, dressed in what looked like some kind of uniform. We are not interested in this debris, Mister. Neelix, more at ease now that she had indicated no interest in the waste field, adopted his most gracious mien. I'm Neelix, and since you are not interested in my debris, then I am delighted to meet you. The woman smiled. Captain Catherine Janeway of the Federation Starship Voyager. Neelix had no way of knowing that voice would change his entire life. Neelix found that he couldn't look up at his fellows when he had finished his story. Just as he finally raised his eyes, Harry Kim burst into the shelter. Seven, you've got to come quickly. Something's wrong with Chakotay. He keeps asking for you. Seven looked toward Tuvok, who nodded. Go to him. Vorik had reported to Tuvok's group the story of Captain Janeway's unusual visit, but now it seemed that her blow to Chakotay might have unexpected and disastrous results. As Harry and Seven walked through the fetid air to Chakotay's shelter. Harry told Seven what had happened. First, the commander said he was sick to his stomach. Then the cut started to get inflamed. A little while, he collapsed, moaning, kept saying your name. Seven made no comment, but seemed to be musing on what Harry said. When they entered the shelter, Seven went immediately to Tukote and knelt down. Commander, how can I help you? Chakotay's eyes flickered open. He pointed to the wound on his cheek. Seven, what is this? A small smile played on Seven's lips. If I'm correct, the captain has implanted a Borg nodule in you. Harry was astonished. A Borg implant? Why? I do not know, but I recognize the pattern of the striations. I would estimate that it will fully erupt within minutes. 
And so it did. A gray metallic node distended the skin until it burst through and spread over Chakotay's cheek with tentacles like an octopus. Then the tips embedded themselves back in his flesh. He will feel better now. In a few minutes, the commander seemed to relax somewhat and opened his eyes. What happened? Harry told him. You have something in common with Seven now. You've grown a Borg implant. Seven nodded. I suspect the captain has found a way to send us a message. Chakotay suddenly fell back on the ground, eyes wide in terror. Falling. I had the strongest sensation I was falling. He looked up at Seven. What's happening? I do not know, Commander. Are you aware of any other sensations? Any images? Chakotay seemed to test this thought for a moment. I feel... pulled somehow. As though you want to follow something? Yes, but there's nothing to follow. It is a homing pattern. Carried by the nanoprobes the implant has deposited in your bloodstream. It will lead you toward a signal. The captain is trying to tell us where to come. Eventually, Chakotay fell into a troubled sleep, peppered with dreams about falling endlessly through space. When Neelix returned from the work detail that night, his pockets were full of food. He put a portion for Chakotay's group into water containers to be taken to them by Vorik. But before the young Vulcan could start out, Neelix saw Chakotay and the others of his group straggling along the pathway, carrying their meager belongings and looking as though they'd been in a brawl. This was the first the others had seen of Chakotay's newly erupted implant. Chakotay explained their arrival. We were attacked by some behemoths who thought they were tougher than they were and wanted our rations. We fought them off, but we figured we could use the fracas as an excuse to get out of there and back with you. Tubak nodded approvingly. Well done. This will greatly simplify our plans. Later, in the shelter, Harry was kneeling beside Balana, fiddling and tinkering with two strange-looking contraptions. Harry, I think we're ready to give it a try. We'll try it on the Silamite ore. We'll set it to dematerialize a spot below ten kilometers. That's how far down the Subu sensor net goes. Let's dematerialize the ore, then transport it as powder. A tense moment passed and then a fine shower of white dust materialized in the air and sifted down to the ground. Harry erupted in a shout of joy. It worked! Tuvok silenced him. We must not call attention to ourselves in that way. Then Balana explained the plan. I built two of these transporters because we'll need them to get us out of here. One transporter alone doesn't have the power to dematerialize something as complex as biological organisms and transport them as far as we need to. Harry chimed in. So we'll have to leapfrog our way out. We're going to hollow out a chamber 15 kilometers down and right under the wall that surrounds this place. I'll beam into it with a second transporter, and then Balana will beam someone else to me, and I'll put them on the surface in the woods outside the sensor net. Then we keep it up until everyone's out. Seven continued. After that, Commander Chakotay will lead us. We must trust that the captain has implanted our escape route in him. Harry looked at the ore dust. It's going to take a while to carve out the chamber. We can't keep dumping it here, in the shelter. Neelix smiled. I know a place. Why not beam it right into the ore quarries? There's an area behind the anti-grav storage units where the guards never go. They'll never see it. Neelix gave them the coordinates and Harry continued with the process as the others disbanded. Neelix saw Tuvok leave the shelter and followed him outside. So, Mr. Vulcan, what did you think of my story? I know, I've done some awful things in my life, but I've tried to make up for them. I hope you won't hold what I've told you against me. Tuvok turned slowly to look at him. I found it an exceptional story. You have complexities and courage I never have imagined. Neelix suddenly wished that Kess were here and could hear what Tuvok had to say. She would have been proud. Suddenly, before he had a chance to think about it, he was talking about her. I, I still miss Kess. Sometimes during the night I think I hear her voice and I sit up 
and look around. But of course, she's not there. Tuvok looked at him once more. But she is with us still. Her going was a transcendence, not a death. She is connected to all of us. How do you know this? Our minds were meshed on many occasions. I possess her katra within me, and I sense her presence from time to time. So it's no surprise that you might have done the same. But Tuvok, I have no telepathic powers. But your emotional connection to her was quite strong. I'm sure she has kept that bond. Neelix stared down at the dirt for a moment. I regret that there's so much of her that I never shared. Regret accomplishes nothing. I'm sure you're right, Mr. Vulcan, but some of us can't turn off our feelings on command. Tuvok was silent once more, and Neelix returned to the shelter and lay down. Maybe, if he were lucky, he could at least dream about Guess. He wasn't sure how long he'd been asleep when he heard her voice, and if it was a dream, it was unlike any he'd ever had. He lay quietly, letting happen whatever was happening. He saw in his mind's eye the underground city of the Ocampa. It seemed that he was flying through the city, throughout the deep caverns of the planet. His flight came to an end in the great assembly of the Ocampa where he stared down at a small child, long blonde hair trailing down her back, staring up at an Ocampan man who looked, if anything, beleaguered. Kess was staring up at her father, her small mouth pursed in determination. They were standing in the courtyard of the assembly, the soaring, magnificent structure built for them by the caretaker so many generations before, and which was the focal point of Ocampan life. Here, daily rations were dispensed, entertainment was provided, social groups gathered. Why, Father, does everyone sit around so much? This is our way of life, Kess. This is how people behave. If the caretaker built our home for us under the ground, he must have had a reason to do it. Doesn't anyone ever wonder what it is? Kess, this is where it's safe. Safe from what? from our enemies. They would take our energy and our water. Why? Come along, Kess. Your mother will be waiting for us. I've answered you as best I can. Later that evening, her mother came into her room. We've decided it's time for you to hear about the surface. Usually parents wait until a child has finished the growth cycle, but you are precocious and can probably understand the story now. No one knows or remembers. A disaster befell the planet, and climatic conditions changed. Drought ensued, and water became more valuable than gems. A people called the Kazon began to raid the Ocampan settlements and steal their water. Our people were in danger of dying out. That's when the caretaker presented himself to us. No one knows in what way, but somehow he made it clear that he would protect us from the Kazan. It was a promise. He built this magnificent city for us under the ground and supplied us with endless amounts of energy and water. That was long ago, and he has kept his promise ever since. Kess was bubbling with questions. Has anyone ever tried to go to the surface and see what's there now? Why risk it? We're safe here, and we have everything we need. Her mother rose, signaling an end to the discussion. But Kess knew she had to learn more. Kess met Dagan soon after she'd completed her growth cycle. He was a sweet-faced boy, just slightly older than she, with a quick mind and a ready smile. The first thing she noticed about him 
was that he hurried. She was immediately intrigued that someone besides herself moved to quicker rhythms than most Ocampans. As soon as she told him her name, he posed a question. Would you like to see the farm? She was curious. What was a farm? Dagan led her out of the assembly to unfamiliar parts of the underground space. Shortly, they emerged into a natural chamber which Kess found astonishingly beautiful. Terraces had been carved into the walls of stone, and green plants grew in abundance on each of the terraces. Lights were suspended above them, casting a warm glow throughout the chamber. Dagan, tell me about this place. Whose idea was it to build it? Dagan smiled in comradeship. My mother and her friends created this farm. They believe we shouldn't just sit around all the time, waiting for rations to be handed to us. We work to tend the farm, and we eat the fruits of our labor. Kess stared at him. A sense of wonder and joy enveloped her, for she knew she had found kindred souls. Can I do this too? Of course. I thought you might feel that way. Kess reached out and fingered one of the plants. The leaves were silky and inviting. She felt a peace she had never in her short life known before. It wasn't long after that she found an access tunnel by accident. It was the color that caught her eye. A dark, orangish streak seemed to emanate from a crack in the stone about a meter above her head. Curiosity began to burn in her. She would need help to investigate it. A short while later, she was back with Dagan, who helped her roll a boulder into place. He climbed on it and shone his lamp onto the stain. He tapped on the stone face with a small tool he'd brought from the farm. It's rust. There must be something metal behind that rock face. Let me see if I can pry this section of the rock out. Slowly, gradually, Dagan worked a piece of stone from the casing into which it had been placed. Then Dagan shined his lamp into the opening. Kess, come up here. She scrambled up beside him and stood on tiptoe to peer into the opening. She could see before her a round, darkened chamber with a long, unused control panel of some kind. And immediately adjacent to the panel was one of the most remarkable things Kess had ever seen. A staircase, old, rusting, dilapidated, leading upward. Dagon, what are those stairs for? Dagon looked down at the stone plug. We have to figure a way to put that back. Those stairs lead up, and up is where the surface is, and if we can go up those stairs, the Kazon can come down them. The Kazon again? Why was everyone so frightened of these mythical monsters? Kess shook her head. Dagon, leave it. If anyone got that far down here, one small stone wouldn't provide much protection. If the enemy comes for us, we'll just have to fight. All right. But I want you to promise you won't come back here by yourself. I couldn't stand it if anything were to happen to you. She looked up at him. Dagan, I won't promise not to come here again. But I'll tell you before I do. Kess's first run-in with the elder known as Toscat came shortly before she cut off her hair. It was unusual for someone to request an appointment with an elder before they had completed their growth cycle. The afternoon she met with Toscat, Kess waited in the stark white anteroom while Toscat, in his office, finished a conversation with another elder. She wondered what they talked about, how they occupied their days. There really was nothing for them to do. The caretaker provided for everything. When the doors to Toscat's office opened, he strolled out and smiled. Well, Kess, come in, come in. I've been looking forward to this. He gestured toward his office, and Kess preceded him inside. Well then, Kess, to what do I owe this visit from such a pretty little girl? Kess's cheeks burned. He was treating her like an infant. She took a breath to calm herself, then looked directly into Toscat's eyes. I want to know if there are any written records from our ancestors. Written records? Why are you asking about this? I think we should know as much as possible about our true origins. Toscat stared at her as though he were inspecting an alien insect. 
Kess. You're much too young to be troubling your mind with thoughts like these. Why not get your food rations and spend some time in front of the entertainment screens? That should settle those restless thoughts. She felt anger stirring in her again and rose to her feet. I don't want to settle them down. I'm quite serious, Toscat. Be careful, young lady. I won't be threatened. I'm sorry, Toscat. I meant no disrespect. You're an elder because you have great wisdom, and I only wanted to have the benefit of your knowledge. Toscat's face was wreathed in a smile because of her flattery. There are indeed ancient writings. Only the elders are allowed to peruse them. He signaled that the interview was over. This has been most pleasant. My door is open to you at any time, as it is to all of the Ocampa. One afternoon, as Kess, Dagan, and the others from the farm sat in the assembly hall, discussing what further measures to try to bring pressure on the elders, there was a sudden ringing and a shimmering that seemed to come from nowhere. When it was over, two alien beings lay on the floor of the hall, their skin was covered with a thick white fur. They were much taller than Ocampans, and their heads were elongated into a spherical shape. People noticed that there were what appeared to be sores dotted on the arms and shoulders of both aliens. Kess moved through the group to stand over the alien beings. They're sick. We have to help them. Within minutes, Toscat and two of the other elders had arrived. The caretaker has sent these beings to us. It is our duty to care for them. The two large furry beings were carried off to the central clinic. Within days, two more arrived in the same manner. These strange visitations became a regular occurrence. The elders seemed flummoxed by the events. It was after two weeks of this that Toscat summoned Kess. We know the caretaker is sending us these aliens for a purpose, but we are unable to comprehend what that purpose might be. It has occurred to us, that is, the possibility has been broached, that the caretaker was for some reason unhappy that you were not granted permission to read the old texts. The elders have decided that you may study the writings. For once she felt a twinge of gratitude toward the caretaker. Come with me, Kess, and you can begin immediately. He led her underground to a secret vault. Kess looked around her to see the walls of the room lined with bookshelves, all of which contained bound books of various sizes and thicknesses. Kess walked immediately to the section containing what she perceived to be the oldest of the books. Those, Kess, are the earliest of the writings. They were composed by our forefathers soon after the caretaker created our home here. A history was kept until several generations ago, when the histories gradually dwindled out. Toscat, the first time you read these writings, weren't you excited? Didn't it inspire you? He stared at her with a curious expression. I've never read any of those old tomes. I can't imagine what good would come of it anyway. He turned and went out the door, which closed behind him. Kess stared after him in amazement. Ocampan history was here, at his fingertips, and he'd ignored it. After reading the histories, Kess told her friends at the farm about them. They called it the warming. Gradually, the climate got hotter and hotter until the water on the surface was almost dried up and the whole planet was a desert. The caretaker opened a deep chasm in the ground and led our people here to the city he'd created. Then he erected a special energy barrier that would keep the Kazon from following. He promised to take care of us forever. Aaliyah, a nurse that worked at the central clinic, turned to Kess. But what does any of this have to do with the diseased people the caretaker is sending us? Something has changed, and I think we should find out. She saw Dagan's startled look, but pressed on. 
Dagan and I found an ancient access tunnel that I think leads to the surface. I intend to go see what's happening up there. Maybe it's time for us to leave the underground and live in the sun once more. Later, getting through the portal to the access tunnel wasn't difficult. Kess peered up the shaft, trying to see where it led, but the stairs disappeared into darkness within a few meters. Slowly she climbed so as not to tire herself early. What impelled her upward most of all was her mother's simple pronouncement. She had to see the sun. She had to know its light, to feel its radiant warmth on her skin. As she climbed, she lost track of time and moved in a near stupor. And then, a significant goal. The stairway ended, leading into a tunnel. She was in a cave, but one much, much closer to the surface. Cautiously, she made her way through the passageway. A faint glow began to emanate from somewhere deep within the tunnel. Finally, she stood before a crackling green energy barrier that stretched from one side of the cave wall to the other. This must be the barrier the caretaker had erected to keep out the Kazon. Her eyes roamed over every millimeter of it, and gradually she realized something interesting. The energy emanations seemed to be unevenly distributed through the grid. Along the right side of the grid, there was a long strip of pale yellow. If that were a weak part of the grid, was there something she could do to attack it, weaken it further? She found stones and hurled them against the yellow strip on the right side. The stones were vaporized, but each time, the strip became a paler yellow. She kept up her assault until finally, a gap in the grid developed that she thought she could slide through. Gently, slowly, she squeezed herself through the opening. And then she was on the other side. She moved quickly through the remaining part of the tunnel, where at one point she saw light coming through a few cracks in the wall. It was an opening, and she pushed at rock and earth that had piled up in front of it. In a few moments, she had cleared a space large enough to crawl through, and she emerged into the sunlight. Unimaginable brightness assaulted her. Ahead of her stretched a vast plain, a desert of red-hued dirt studded in the distance with rock outcroppings. Even though it was hot, very hot, Kess felt a slight chill ripple through her. She had done it. She had overcome fear and ignorance and done what everyone else she knew was afraid to do, left the security of her underground womb and flung herself into the unknown. But now what? Across the desert, she saw two figures moving rapidly toward her. The men atop the beasts were very large and wore an elaborate headdress which was wild and unkempt. Were these Kazan? The beasts charged hard until they were almost upon her, then pulled up suddenly. Kess looked up at the riders. What's this? A little mole that's come creeping into the light? Maybe we should just squash it and let the insects eat it clean. <laughs> Who are you? Where do you come from? One of the men suddenly leapt off his beast and peered down at Kess. Jabin will be intrigued with her. Let's get her back to camp. And Kess felt herself suddenly lifted into the air and flung across the huge beast. In a scant few minutes, Kess could see what appeared to be structures rising from the desert floor, ruins of edifices that had crumbled from age or attack. Nearby was a cluster of makeshift buildings. Their headlong ride over... The men jumped off the beasts and roughly pulled Kess down as well. They half dragged, half carried her inside one of the structures. She saw at the opposite end of the room another of the rough-looking men, sitting in a chair with an indolent, arrogant pose. Kess decided to go on the offensive. I'd like to know who you are and why you've brought me here. By all means, plucky one. I am Jabin. And they wisely brought you here because they realized you can be of great service to us. Are you Kazan? We are indeed. 
Kazan Ogla, the strongest and most courageous of all the sects. Jabin reached out and put his fingers on her face, turning it first one way and then the other. You will make a lovely servant girl. Kess jerked her chin out of his grasp. I have no intention of becoming your servant. Immediately, she felt a stinging blow to the side of her head, and she went sprawling. Jabin stood over her. Let's be clear on this. Everyone in this camp does exactly what I tell them. You are certainly no exception. When I ask you a question, answer me like this. Yes, Maj. Do you understand? Yes, Maj. She was suddenly jerked to her feet, and she struggled to stand alone. If you behave, we can get along very nicely. Don't you think? Yes, Maj. Very good. I want to know all about you, my little Ocampa. You will be the means of our regaining the water that is rightfully ours. Three weeks later, Kess could barely remember anything of her life underground. She spent long days waiting on Jabin, preparing and serving him meals. Sometimes at night, when she was finally allowed to crawl to a crude mat in a small outbuilding and sleep for a few hours, she would try to summon up the memory of her mother and father. But they seemed like dream figures, vaporous and fleeting. Only one triumph was hers, and she clung to it desperately. She had not revealed the place of her emergence from underground. Jabin had taken her to the place where his men had discovered her, but she insisted to the Maj that everything all looked alike to her, and she didn't know where the entrance to the tunnel was. Jabin beat her, assuming she was lying, and he gave up the search. But he denied her food and water for the rest of the day. Two weeks after that, Neelix came into her life. He was a good man, she was sure of that. Her mind had told her that immediately. She could only hope that he had some kind of plan that would spare her from torture, even if he couldn't get her off the planet. After talking with Jabin alone, presently, the visitor came out of the stone structure, searching till he found her. When they moved out of earshot of the miners, he turned to her. I've convinced Jabin to let me try to befriend you, so that you'll reveal the opening of the tunnel to your city. We can keep him at a distance for a while, until I can figure out a way to get you off the planet. Kess was so relieved, she almost stumbled. Thank you. He was going to torture me. She clutched his arm as though afraid ever to let go. I don't know what to call you. I'm Neelix. She smiled. I'm Kess. You're the first good person I've met since I came from underground. Tell me about your city. You've lived underground all your life? You've never been in space? Kess hesitated. She wanted this man to care about her, not to discover what a rash and impetuous child she'd been. So she gave the briefest of accounts. For almost two weeks, Neelix visited the encampment frequently, spending long hours with Kess. She was happier than she'd ever been. From time to time, Neelix would visit Jabin, reporting the progress he was making in winning Kess's confidence. Then he told her he had a plan. Tomorrow I'll tell him you've agreed to show me the opening, but only me. What he won't know is that my little ship will be parked not far from there so that you and I can run for it and leave the planet before he realizes we're not coming back. Kess pondered this. Won't he try to follow us? Neelix smiled and patted her hand lovingly. I know this part of space better than I know my own spots. Kess nodded, but she was feeling weak from dehydration. What is it, Kess? What's wrong? Jabin took away my water rations. I'm a little dizzy. That monster! I'll go speak to him! She grabbed his sleeve. No, don't do anything to provoke him. It's only one more day. <laughs> 